So it's 6 p.m. Um, GMT plus three. We will wait for five more minutes for other participants to join. Please feel free to use the chat to introduce yourself. Yeah, I may, let me start. I'm Joki. Um, I'm part of the organizers of Our Ladies Nairobi. Thank you so much for being with us today as we have been taken through a very awesome tutorial on making web ready maps. Yeah, I'm also a master's student at Hasselt University taking statistics and data science, however, specializing in statistics. Yeah, I use R for school and um, for creating to choose the maps. Uh, sorry, plots. <laughs> I think the map is in me right now. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, anyone else can feel free to introduce us in the chat. And Maggie, uh, do you mind taking over? Uh, yes, uh, Lucy, thanks. Thanks. Um, actually, I'll be the moderator of today's uh, meetup. And uh, for those who are joining, um, thank you so much for being here. If you're not comfortable with, um, we will be recording today's session. So if you're not com comfortable with that, you can change your name to a dummy name. Feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Yeah, and we will start um, at 6 or 5 p.m. That is GMT plus three. So like at, after four minutes, four minutes from now, yeah. Awesome, it's so great that we have a small group, which means I think we have time for everyone to introduce themselves and maybe let me know um, what you do and um, how much experience do you have with R or mapping, that would be nice. In the chat or feel free to unmute um, and talk out loud too. Um, hi, I'm from Argentina. Uh, it's great you're here. Asma, do you mind if you stop sharing so that Maggie can share her screen and of then um, you will share during the training session? Yeah, thank you. Hey, Jawad, nice to see you here. We will start in the next two minutes. Please feel free to introduce yourself. You may use the chats. Yeah, you can tell us what you use are for, um, what do you do currently? Yeah. So Maggie, you may take over the virtual mic. I pass over to you. <laughs> oh yeah, it's exactly... Um... 
here in, here in Kenya, it's 6.05 p.m. GMT plus three. So yeah, thank you everyone who's joined us. Um, we will start and um, the rest of the participants will um, join us um, as time goes. So um, thank you so much, um, Asma, uh, for uh, doing this for us. Um, we are very excited. And uh, the agenda uh, of today is, is uh, displayed on the screen. And um, I will just go right on to introduce our speaker of today. So um, Asma is the Director of Analytics and Research at Pasukia, a telehealth company specializing in uh, treating substance use disorder. And by night, uh, she's also the Editor-in-Chief of Hockey Graphs, which is a hockey sports analytics blog. So we are really excited to have you do this for us, Asma. And, um, yeah, we can't wait to see um, and learn about making web ready maps. Um, personally, it's something I have never done uh, before. So I'm really excited and I'm sure I'm not the only one. <laughs> so yeah, so um, yeah, so that marks the end of the introduction. And I will stop sharing my screen now so that um, you can take over from Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Well, so thank welcome, you. Asma. Yeah. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here to just reintroduce myself, my background, how I got into mapping, and hopefully that will inspire you to start mapping. Um, and I've provided for everyone some starter code. So if you go on my GitHub, and uh, download the materials, you can play around as I'm going through the presentation. So I will put that in the chat for everyone. Um, and it's okay if you don't know how to use GitHub or anything, I will be going over the, the exact same materials with you all step by step. So yeah, and I have a question here. Can we ask questions? uh during the presentation yes please feel free to interrupt me at any point um and also ask questions at the end i, I don't mind either way uh, i only ask that you know if you have a question during the presentation please unmute yourself and and ask it because um i won't be really monitoring the the chat and maggie if there's if there's a a person that asks a question via chat, please feel free to interrupt me and I'll address it. Yeah, uh, sure. Okay, awesome. So I will start uh, sharing my screen. Okay, hopefully everyone can see uh, my PowerPoint presentation. Uh, so once again, thank you so much for having me. Today, we'll be talking about how to make web ready maps from a beginner's perspective. So for me, my journey in mapping uh, started um, in not the greatest circumstances. Um, as you know, we've had a really devastating year worldwide because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, I was working as a data analyst at a hospital network, uh, doing both academic projects and also uh, internal optimization projects for the hospital I was working at. And I remember when COVID-19 started to be really of high concern for us in the United States, uh, we had to pause some of our projects and focus on uh, COVID-19 because we were given uh, grants to uh, study the rate of spread of COVID-19 and to develop tools that help public health officials and also the public to um, understand the dynamics and to be proactive in trying to slow down the spread of COVID-19. So that's really where it all started for me. 
uh, we developed a predictive model looking at how fast COVID-19 spreads at the county level in the United States. So in the United States, for those that are unfamiliar, we have states and then we have um, counties, which is the next uh, layer of geography right under state. So once we developed the model, we were thinking about the tools that we can create to transmit our findings. And it became immediately clear that the best way to do that is to have an interactive map. So when I was digging into mapping, um, it was quite uh, stressful uh, because Googling how to make a map will return a lot of technologies, um, a lot of words that I was not familiar with. So, you know, it, it was very overwhelming to try and nail down a specific technology, um, let alone trying to understand, you know, the different uh, words that are being used when it comes to mapping. So, one thing I think that helped me in my journey as a as a programmer and as a data scientist, especially being self taught because I did not go to school for computer science I did not go to school for statistics is really to try and narrow down what it is i'm trying to accomplish first. What are my limitations so we had a few considerations in mind when developing this tool. First, I know that it needed to be fast because when people use your tool, especially if they have to go on the internet, uh, it has to be able to render very rapidly or else people will just think something is wrong with your tool and they'll close the window and never come back. So for things like COVID-19, we didn't want to run the risk of, of losing people right off the bat because it wasn't rendering uh, fast enough. And there were also considerations for people that do not have a fast internet connection. We wanted them to be able to access it really rapidly as well. So that was the first consideration, which helped narrow down uh, some technologies that uh, I knew were faster than others. We also needed it to be interactive, this map, because we wanted users to be able to focus on specific states or specific counties. We wanted them to be able to hover over a county, so meaning if they take their cursor to a specific place in the map, then they could get additional information about the county itself. So that interactivity was going to be really important. And that once again, really narrowed down the technologies and the softwares that I needed to use to make it interactive. Uh, another consideration now on my end, not the user end, was that I did not want to learn a new language. <laughs> so anything that was Java, JavaScript, um, D3 related was out of the question for me, just given the time constraint uh, that we had in terms of developing a tool for COVID-19, which as you can appreciate, we needed to be very quick with. So for me, that was a really important consideration, which meant also that I narrowed down uh, the technology that I was going to use, which is going to be R because we are at an R meetup. <laughs> um, the fourth consideration is that given that we are building tools for the public, for public health officials, uh, you know, you want it to look professional and you want it to be aesthetically appropriate and even aesthetically pleasing. So, uh, you know, no, no shade to default ggplots or anything, but we wanted something that could have the quality of being in, let's say, the New York Times. So that was an important consideration, which helped us once again narrow down um, 
the the packages that allow for uh, really beautiful, powerful maps. So because I knew I wanted an R based workflow, I started digging into the ecosystem that R offers and turns out that R is to no surprise really to anyone in this group is an extremely powerful language and it is especially well suited for uh, geo computation and mapping, especially interactive mapping. And that has to do with just R being an object oriented functional programming language, just the way that it's built and designed makes it really easy for it to interface with other technologies like GIS, which is geographic information system software. Uh, it's easy to, to make our work with other geo libraries, which we'll talk about in a minute. And um, anything having to do with spatial statistics also is made uh, quite easy. And this is thanks to just the enormous efforts uh, by multiple members in the community in trying to build out this ecosystem. So as we can see on this plot on the right hand side, we can look over time at the popularity of some of these packages in this spatial ecosystem. And one thing to note is that not only are there multiple, uh, packages at our disposal, but there's one that has really skyrocketed in terms of popularity, and that's the SF package. And the SF package is here in purple, and you can see that extraordinary growth in popularity. And that has to do with the fact that it's not only open source, of course, everything is open source, but it allows you to really have powerful functionalities when it comes to mapping and performing spatial computations. So I'm excited to introduce that in, in just a little bit. So my journey with mapping took about three weeks, uh, four weeks at best, which um, is thanks really to, to the tools that people have developed and the tutorials that people have written. And we were able to deploy a website, a Shiny app, uh, that has this interactive map and it is still available. So if you're curious about it, there is a link at the bottom of this slide. Um, and we will be building a map, an interactive map in Shiny together, which is a lot like this one. So I'm excited to, to show you uh, just how, um, how straightforward the process can be once uh, we understand just the basics of mapping, some terminology behind it, and things to consider. So for this portion of the talk, I will be moving on to an R Markdown document. And if you're following with me on GitHub, which I've included the GitHub link in the chat, please feel free to download that and look at it with me together. Momentarily stop sharing while I pull my R Markdown. Can everyone see the arm markdown? Yes, yes. Okay, beautiful. And then the GitHub contains um, the arm markdown, which you can render and the presentation as well. Okay, so one of the things we just talked about is in your mapping journey, it's worth spending a little bit of time uh, being acquainted with the different terminologies and the different words that are used in, when it comes to mapping. So we will explore the SF package to do that. And the SF package stands for simple features. And simple features is a hierarchical data model that represents a wide range of geometry types. 
So, you know, in mapping, we have these shapes, right? We, we can have different shapes. We can have lines, points, squares, and when you put them together, it forms what's called a geometry collection. So that's one piece of terminology that uh, we need to have at the back of our mind. And we'll see uh, when that shows up when it comes to implementation. But more about the SF package. So the SF package is an R package and it provides a set of tools for working with the objects that are presented above. And the really amazing thing about, about this package is that these objects are stored in a data frame. And in this data frame, you'll see there's a special column, which is usually called geometry or geom. And this simple fact that we can store information about the geometries that we're interested in, whether that's a state, a country, a map, a province. The very fact that it's in a data frame allows us to manipulate them however we would like. And because it's a data frame, you can also join it to other data frames. So that will be very useful because if we go back to the COVID-19 example, once I've obtained the shapes and the geometries needed to plot counties, the next thing that I needed to do is to join a data frame containing information about the COVID-19 rates. So you can see here that we're already, we're already establishing a workflow here um, that is data frame centric. And because of that, we can do all sorts of manipulations um, that we would want. There's also additional advantages, apart from the fact that spatial objects are stored in data frames. You can have fast reading and writing of the data. So you can imagine you could save these um, on your computer and share them with others. The plotting performance is also enhanced through this SF package, which explains both of these things, I think, explain the the growth and popularity of this package compared to its other colleagues. SF package, as we've seen, can be treated as data frames. So if we can treat it as a data frame, that means uh, we can use the piping operator. And if you're a tidyverse uh, person, that is a really powerful functionality. And once you get acquainted with the SF package, uh, then the, um, the terminology used within the package is relatively consistent and intuitive. So, you know, in terms of trying to learn this package, you know, if you sit down once and, and try to wrap your mind around the different commands, and if you happen to be mapping then frequently, then you'll see that a lot of them will come back to you because they have this consistent uh, terminology. So due to these advantages, the SF package is now supported in many other popular packages. So you may have heard of TMAP, which is ggplot2, but for mapping. You may have heard of Tidy Census, which is a package for US census data. Uh, but as we've said, SF is not the only package that's out there, even though it's, it's grown a lot in popularity. There's also the SP package, which is still quite popular. And SP is really SF's ancestor, uh, but they, not really ancestors because they still coexist, but um, SF was definitely an attempt to improve some of the functionalities in SP. The only thing to note here is that the geometry objects are of different classes for these two packages. Uh, but it's okay because if there's a package that you need to use that doesn't support that specific class, then there's really helpful functions to switch between those two classes. So for SP, the objects are of class spatial and SF is of another type, but it's quite easy to switch between them. 
Okay, so given given just an understanding of the terminologies and how SF works, uh, we can start implementing. So the packages that we'll be needing today are the tidyverse, of course, the classic for cleaning and wrangling. A package that I really like is janitor. So it allows me to do other cleaning tasks. I use it almost every day to clean my column names uh, because, you know, sometimes you get these data sets with column names that have weird characters in them and some stuff is capitalized, some stuff is not. So I run janitor right off the bat to get all my column names to be lowercase and remove all the weird characters in my column names. Library SF, of course, the star of the show today for spatial manipulation and spatial objects. We'll be using the R Kenya Census package, a package developed by our very own uh, Shell over here in the audience, which contains Kenyan shape files. Um, so shape files is another word that we'll have to get acquainted with. It really just means your geometry object. We'll be using R2D3 maps package, which allows us to stay in R, but make 3D maps and three and deep, sorry, D3 maps. And D3 is a really popular uh, technology, uh, kind of like, you know, uh, plotly which allows for interactive uh, maps, uh, but we'll be taking advantage of this package to, to have all our workflow be R-based. We'll be using Shiny, and Shiny is to make interactive web maps and, and to deploy them. Shiny CSS loaders, so that is a cool little package that allows you to have a loading symbol when someone uh, tries to access your app. So we knew that this was going to be important on the user side because you know you could use the most efficient technologies in the world, but you know, given people's internet connection, uh, it can still take a little while for these maps to show up. So we wanted to include a symbol for the user just so that they know that it's coming, that nothing is broken, it's just taking a little while. The Leaflet package, Leaflet is an amazing um, JavaScript based uh, technology that allows for maps and static ones, interactive ones. Um, and we'll be using, of course, the R uh, version of, of this. Uh, a, another package called R Color Brewer, which has a lot of nice color palettes. And then finally, HTML tools, which allows us to have interactivity when it comes to generating pop ups when someone hovers over a certain part of the map. So our workflow really begins with identifying the, the packages that we're going to be requiring. And the second uh, step of the workflow is to start assembling our data. So um, up to you, you can begin by assembling your geometry data, or you can start by assembling the, the data that you'll be mapping. It's, it's up to you. But um, I like to start with, you know, sort of uh, an approach that's from the ground up, right? So first, what I need is my shapes, which means I need my counties plotted. And then on top of the counties, I will overlay information about COVID-19. So having that um, thought process, I think, can be, can be helpful to just build out that foundation first. So with that being said, our foundation will be through the R Kenya Census Package by Shell which allows us to obtain, once again, Kenyan county shape files. And not only that, but she has attached 
uh, really important county level information about the demographics of those counties and social and economic census data. So with this package, uh, you can begin mapping right away without worrying about joining an extra data set to, to the shapefile. So thank you, Shell, for doing this work. Um, having worked with, with shapefiles myself, I know just how much work goes into that. So shout out, Shell. And for a list of all the amazing data contained in this package, you can run data and data catalog and get a, a printout in your console of all the things contained. So the first thing that uh, you should do is inspect the class type of those shape files. So basically what I'm doing here is calling upon the package and I know that the shape files are contained here. And I wanna check the class. Why do I wanna check the class? Well, because we've seen that there's some packages that offer the geometries in different classes, right? We've seen that the SP package has objects of class spatial, and then the SF package has another class. So it's important to just know right off the bat, what is your class type so that you're not frustrated when your map doesn't render. Um, so because you know, if you run into that problem, maybe your geometries are not of the correct type. So with that being said, you can run class on these. And what we realize here is that the printout indicates that the shape files are of SP type. So um, given that we want to use the SF package, uh, given that the other packages we'll be relying on for mapping, such as leaflet and R2D3 maps, I know that they only support geometries of class SF, we'll have to convert these shapefiles right off the bat. So uh, we've seen that there's helpful functions that allows us to switch between these, these two classes. Um, it's really, yeah, go ahead. I'm so, 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 so sorry for interrupting, but uh, there's a request to zoom your screen just a bit. More. Of course, yeah, I'm happy yeah. to. Okay, is this is this better? Um, Jawad, is it better? On my end, it's better. Yeah, it's better. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So I was saying that you know we've run class on these shape files. We've realized they're of class SP, but we also know that the other packages we'll be using downstream will require our shapes to be of another class, specifically the SF class. So thankfully, it's really easy to uh, switch them, to switch classes. So with just one, one command from the SF package, which is ST as SF. And with that, your geometries will be converted and you can save this as uh, an object, which we will call SHP, which stands for shapefiles. And what you can do next, and I think it's really always important to be inspecting the, your classes and to make sure that nothing is getting accidentally dropped or coerced into some other unexpected class type is just to run STR, so structure of this of this data that we just uh, saved, and uh, successfully it is of class SF and data frame. So that's exactly what we expect. We know that the SF package is amazing and it's powerful because it allows us to have geometries be part of any data frame object. So. That's great. We can see some information about what's contained in this data. So we have um, county names and we have population and area and some other data here. And of course, the, the one of the most important ones to check for and, and to verify that it's, that it's of correct type is this geometry column. So this geometry column contains all the information needed to plot those Kenyan counties. And we can see that it's of 
uh, class SFC multi polygon, which sounds like a mouthful, but it's something that we know from our earlier exploration. It's something that makes sense because it's one of the it's one of the shapes. Great. So right off the bat, uh, you can take this data and feed it into Leaflet or D3 or Tmap or even ggplot2 to start mapping. But I wanted to do a little bit more manipulation just to just really to to demonstrate to you how flexible these SF data frames are in the fact that you can manipulate certain columns without affecting uh, the geometry one in in any way and any manipulation that you do the geometry column will always be there so let's say you start with like a huge data set containing like a hundred columns um, and then you realize oh i only need like 20 of them so you do a select and then you put all the columns you need you don't even have to worry about specifying that you want the geometry column. The geometry column will always be in your data, no matter what. You don't even need to select it. So that's an advantage, but it could also be a kind of a disadvantage. Let's say you're building a shiny app. The first part of your app was a map, and then the second part was uh, just a data table. Uh, you're going to have to explicitly drop the geometry column, and you have to do it with a special command in the SF package, because running select minus geometry will not work. That's how stubborn these SF data frames are, so that's a, a consideration to have in mind. But with that being said, uh, what I wanted to do is obtain population counts uh, by county and doing some additional manipulations. I know that the that the population was already included here, but I just wanted to do some more uh, manipulations. So I don't think it's that important really to focus on this code. Just know that you can do any additional manipulations you want um, using tidyverse without affecting the integrity of your spatial data frame. Great. Uh, one thing you may want to check just right before your mapping process is to check what's called the coordinate reference system. So coordinate reference system, it defines how the spatial elements of the data relate to the surface of the earth or other bodies. So it's not terribly important right now to wrap your mind around the different coordinate reference systems. I think what's important here is just to look at the documentation and see, for example, for our Kenya census package, looking at the documentation, what kind of, uh, what is the CRS of those geometries? And if you look at that documentation, you'll see that it's WGS 84 projection, which Personally, I don't know what it means, but what's important is that you check whether the packages that you'll be using support these kind of projections. Um, really, you don't need to do this right off the bat, but let's say you've done everything right. You have your spatial data frame. You have the features that you want in it and then you, you map and then it doesn't render or there's an error, it may be worth it to check the CRS and to see if they uh, agree with each other. It's actually something that I ran into when I, when I wrote this tutorial because my R2D3 map wasn't rendering. And I'm like, Hmm, that's weird. I there, there doesn't seem to be an error in my code, and it had to do with the CRS, the projections. So, thankfully, once again, the SF package makes it quite easy for converting between different projections. So you can do so with SD transform, 
and I did it here. I changed uh, my SHP data frame into this CRS instead. And lo and behold, my map worked just as expected. So something to keep in mind. All right, so I think now the fun can begin. So first workflow I'll be demonstrating is with Leaflet. So for those that have maybe heard of Leaflet but don't really know what it is, it's a very, very popular open source JavaScript based library that allows for both static and interactive maps. You'll see that many websites use it. New York Times, Washington Post, GIS software like OpenStreetMap, Mapbox, CardoDB. You'll see also a lot of government um, websites use Leaflet. Uh, and it has to do just because it's open source and it's powerful and it's fast and it's really, really flexible. And we're very lucky to have an R package that allows us to take advantage of that. And it has many helpful features that make interactive mapping quite a breeze. So first uh, we have the ability to zoom in and have that be an interactive a component, we can layer many combinations. So if you remember earlier from my talk, you know, the, the bottom up approach, um, you can apply it here. You can have a foundation and then keep adding things on top of one another. So you can imagine you can make a heat map, but you also want markers, markers maybe that symbolize a city or symbolize uh, McDonald's in, in a county, you can add markers and you can add really as many layers as you'd like. Of course, you have to be careful not to add too many things or else it's not cohesive and comprehensive anymore, but um, that's, that's really great part of Leaflet. Uh, the other advantage is that we never have to leave R or R Studio. our entire workflow can be done in R. You can easily insert these maps in our markdown, shiny, really anything that you can think of. You can easily render spatial objects from the SB or SF package or data frames with latitude and longitude columns. You can display maps in other projection types. Um, so if that is a consideration, know that leaflet has got your back and you can augment map features using uh, leaflet plugins. So that's really some more advanced um, uses if, if you need to be using them. So given this introduction on leaflet and the many advantages, we can start mapping. So we'll make a chloral pleth of Kenyan county level populations, and then we'll embed that map in a shiny dashboard. So before we get to the fun part, there's some things we need to, uh, we need to set from the get-go. Uh, first off, the color palette. Because we'll be looking at populations and because we wanna see, we wanna be able to visually see which counties have a higher population than others, we're going to be picking a color palette uh, with different colors. This one, I'm picking a palette from the R Color Brewer package, which is basically going from light yellow to uh, dark red. So PAL stands for just palette, and then because I'm going to be binning these populations, I'm calling on color bin, giving it the palette name from the R color brewer package. And then I'm specifying what is the column that we will, um, we will use for the, for coloring purposes, purposes, which is our total population. 
then I knew that I wanted a pop-up message. So what that means is when the user hovers around a county, there's a pop-up that appears and it will have some information. And the information that I wanted to have was the county name and the county population. And you'll see here that I'm um, specifying things around how I want it to look. So this is basically um, HTML, CSS, saying that I want this to be in bold. Um, and I also want you to skip a line after giving me the county name. So county name in bold, skip a line, and then give me the total population. And then I'm piping that to HTML tools. And we have to do this to just make that pop up interactive and make it work. So then uh, I'm going to start uh, building my Shiny app. So for those who have built a Shiny app, hopefully this is uh, familiar, and if you haven't, highly recommend uh, going on the Shiny website uh, part of the R Studio and just uh, seeing what's out there in terms of different app structures. But basically, I'm making um, an app where I will have um, just basically different uh, tabs uh, in the app, with the first tab being the interactive map and the second tab being the data. So that's what you're seeing here. Uh, tab panel number one will be the interactive map. I am also um, calling upon leaflet output, which is how you get your map to, to render in the UI. And I'm wrapping all of that in with Spinner. And with Spinner is from the Shiny SS Loaders package, which allows that loading symbol to, um, to wrap around the map, just in case the map takes a little while to, to render. And then the second tab will be the data. And I am displaying the data with the help of the DT package. So that's the data table package. It allows for interactive uh, data tables that the user can filter um, however they'd like. So really the, the shiny process starts with like specifying the UI, which we have. We said we're, we're going to want a map and we're going to want the data. And then the next part is the server. And that's really where you're going to be uh, providing code to make the actual map. So to make the map, we're going to have to call upon render leaflet. And here, uh, step by step, we're initializing leaflet by passing it our spatial data frame, CHP. Here we are saying uh, we don't want an output showing us the entire world. Let's just focus on Kenya. So that's, I'm specifying just longitude, latitude here, uh, along with the zooming level. Then you add the tiles. So what that is, once again, going back to our bottom up approach. So you're going to be specifying the uh, the basic layer of this map. And there's different options here. You'll see that the one I picked, and I'm kind of revealing the surprise here, but the one I picked is just a simple map of just country borders. But there's really fancy ones out there. You can get some with like roads and forests and rivers and even like different colors. Let's say this this is too like gray for you. You can get some with like really beautiful ocean colors, like light sky blue and, and stuff like that. So it's really just an aesthetic uh, choice and really a choice that you have to make in terms of what kind of data um, you want to display. But for this one, I just picked the really the most simplest one with just the uh, country shapes. And it doesn't even have like country names or 
city names or anything, but know that there are many, 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 many tiles you can import that have that kind of information. Okay, so yeah, once again, that bottom up approach. So we've picked our tiles, which is just country shapes. Then now we need to add polygons. So polygons, what that means is we're going to be saying, okay, these counties, first off, I want you to color them by total population. Then I'm going to specify this additional stuff about how I want that stuff to look really. So things like um, opacity level, uh, the color of the borders of those counties. Um, also just some, what happens if you like wanna highlight them when you hover over them. Uh, the labels that I want when you hover over them, which goes back to something we've specified over here, right? We've specified what we want in the pop-up and things of that nature. And here you'll see it's CSS and HTML. So it's, it's really customizable in terms of how you want uh, your, your map to look. And then I'm adding a legend to, to the map. So basically, uh, given, you know, about one, two, three, four um, commands, you can have a really elegant uh, map that is interactive. And that's what we're seeing here. So I've zoomed in and out, but if you re-render this document, you'll see that it's automatically zoomed on Kenya. And you can see just how fast it renders, but also how fast the zoom is. So definitely don't take this for granted. You know, when I was developing my COVID-19 app, I played around with different packages and some packages do not allow for this fast of zooming. So this is a huge, huge advantage um, in Leaflet and the SF package. And then so you can zoom in and out as much as you'd like. And then when you hover, you have information about the county, just as we've specified, right? We said we wanted counties in bold. And then the second line can be the population. So obviously, this is just a very quick map that I made. And you can certainly play around and try to improve it by just maybe adding like county semicolon name and then population colon. You can also add a code to, um, for example, add like a column. Uh, I mean, um, a comma after like 781 just to, to help readers better um, ingest the numbers here. And you'll see also the, the legend that we've specified, which we've specified as bins. But you can certainly, you know, have this legend be numeric instead, so meaning not binned. Um, there's different options you can have here. And you'll see that uh, Leaflet uh, kind of helped us out here, right? We were just talking about how an improvement could be to add like a comma, and they've already done that here right off the bat because we can see these commas that um, are really helpful. Great, so that was our first tab. And then the second tab is just the, the data. So one thing I mentioned earlier in this talk is the fact that SF data frames are very stubborn and they will always, always have that geometry column, no matter what manipulations you do to the data. And um, in order to display, you know, your data, you know, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be helpful at all to have, you know, a geometry column because what is what is your user going to do with that? Absolutely nothing. It's completely incomprehensible. So the way to drop that column is to call upon ST drop, drop geometry right here, and then the rest of this code is just information relating to how I want uh, the data table to be structured.
Any questions about this process before we move on to the next workflow? I can also check the chat. So some installation issues with the Arcania census. Have you been able to resolve those, Jawad? Looks like uh, Sahin, and I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, but looks like she has some helpful, or they have some helpful information about maybe doing it through DevTools. Okay, if there are no additional questions or concerns about the leaflet workflow, I will move on to my second favorite workflow, which is through D3. Oh, you have a question, Moses? Do you want to unmute or type it in the chat? Yeah, maybe I just uh, unmute and just ask. Sure, yeah. Yeah, very briefly, how do you make maybe the ocean Buddhists to have a, a blue background? As it's just, uh, that's always displayed. Sorry, you said the ocean, how to make it like display the, the name of the, and the lakes. Not, not, not really the names, but the blue background so that maybe the, the, the water bodies become blue in a way. Oh, okay, I see your question. So there are many, yeah. many tiles you can import. Um, the one I picked just has the ocean as this like grayish color. But if you go on the leaflet page, you'll see that there's different tiles which have the ocean in a different color. And you can select, there's a really helpful, let me stop sharing. I'm gonna look it up on Google and put it in the chat. But there's like a website with all the different options. it share my screen so right over here you can see the different tiles that you can import as your base tiles so for this one it has really a lot of information relating to the names of of the cities and it has that ocean in a different color now in terms of like specifying the color that you want for the ocean let's say none of these satisfy you that's that i don't know if you can do with leaflet i'm sure you can but it would probably involve some hacking i know that if you really need that customizability then you can use map box so Mapbox is a third workflow that I will not talk about today, but with Mapbox, it makes it really, really easy to manipulate uh, colors and uh, even the font of like the city names and, and stuff like that. So if you need that level of, of customizability, then Mapbox may be, it may be an option. Thank you. Of course, yeah. I don't know what happened to my doc RMD, but I think this is it. <laughs> okay, here it is. Um, so I will move on to if there we are have no another question. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Brian has asked if there is a way to work around for heavy ship files that take a longer time to render in leaflets. Yeah. So, you know. The, the great thing about the geometries that are included 
as part of the SF package, it will be quite fast to render them. There's another package that has geometries of different countries, also called R Natural Earth. That one has geometries that render quite fast. Our Kenya Census, the package we use today, Shell has probably worked hard to make those geometries quite lightweight, and I can tell that they're lightweight because it takes two seconds for my map to generate. But there will be circumstances in which the shape files you have are very, very heavy. And there are helpful packages that help you do what's called simplifying them, which just basically means uh, that the resolution of those shapes will not be as precise. So it's almost like a smoothing technique, if, if you will, of those shapes. And that smoothing allows for less time in terms of rendering. Because you know, you can imagine your computer doesn't have to be obsessed with like every single like little detail about that. That, that shape, it can just smooth over it and still be somewhat accurate. So there, there are things you can explore um, for that as well. Okay, thank you. Bren, I hope your question has been answered. Yeah. Great, so yeah, the second workflow is D3. D3, once again, is a technology that is also JavaScript based and it produces, once again, you know, just like Leaflet, dynamic, uh, interactive maps, but also other data visualizations. So Leaflet is really for mapping and D3, it allows for maps, but also um, interactive visualizations, uh, data visualizations such as bar plots and, and so forth. And um, it's a lot like uh, Plotly as well. So if you have experience with Plotly, D3 is, is almost its, its cousin. Like Leaflet, it has uh, many of the same advantages, at least through the R2 D3 maps, is that it allows us to never really have to leave R or R Studio. And we can also easily insert these maps in R Markdown or Shiny um, or more. So the disadvantages of this approach, though, compared to Leaflet, is that the zooming and the layering is not possible out of the box. So what I mean by out of the box is that it does not come with the package. You can, you can add zooming and layering, but it, it would have to mean you would have to write JavaScript code. So, you know, that's, that's a disadvantage. However, I still think that R2 D3 maps are really helpful because they, they require less code to set up than Leaflet and they still look really great and they're still interactive. So I think in terms of when I need to make a map just for myself or for an internal meeting, I'll go with R2 D3 maps because it's quite, it's quite easy to generate with just basically like two commands and we'll see that in a, in a second. And for this portion, we will not be plotting population. We'll be looking at um, permanent crops in Kenya. So basically the, the number of population that farms these permanent crops. So basically what I'm doing here is I am restarting my workflow from scratch as if I didn't do all of the previous ones. So first, I'm, you know, importing my shape files through the Arkenia census package. I am converting it because I want it to be a class SF. I'm saving it as my data frame called SHP. I am basically doing some data manipulations in terms of um, calculating the total population. I am doing some additional manipulations here. I'm changing the projection of, of the shape files. I am importing an additional data set which contains information about crops. 
I am doing some additional manipulations here with that crops data set, and then I'm joining it to my main shapefile data set, which contains our population and our geometries. And then this will be familiar as well. We are building another Shiny app. And uh, this time it will be a much simpler Shiny app. We don't have different tabs or anything. We just have one, uh, one tab, if you will, containing our map. And you know, a Shiny app, we start once again with specifying the UI. The UI, you'll see here that the verb to pay, the command to pay attention to is D3 output. So just like the one we did previously with leaflet, we used leaflet output. Here we use D3 output. I am adding radio buttons to this map uh, because uh, let's say the user only wants to focus on coffee or they only want to focus on citrus, they can do that. And then the second part of a Shiny app is the server. So here we are um, actually building out the map. And this is where we build the map. And then we have to wrap it in render D3 uh, to make it work in Shiny. So this is what I was talking about. Um, this is all you need <laughs> to build a D3 map thanks to the R2D3 package. Obviously, it comes at the disadvantage of customizability, but we'll see in a second that it's still a quite elegant map. So what we're here, what we're doing here is uh, saying that the shape are supplied by this by this SHP data set that we made. Uh, we're gonna say, please add continuous breaks for the different variables. So we're not going to be binning it. We're just going to keep it as continuous. The tooltip here is basically the pop-up message. So as a pop-up message, all I wanted was just tell me what the county name is. You can add a legend and you can add uh, labs, which just like ggplot2, you can add like title, subtitle, um, etc. And then the title legend, because we'll be looking at different crops, you just have to specify that. And then I am making this map extra interactive, right? Because I was like, I want the user to be able to focus on different crops if they needed to. So basically what this thing is, D3 map proxy, what it allows you to do is when someone changes their mind and wants to look at coffee instead, the map doesn't recreate itself, it just updates. So what that means is that the user doesn't have to wait every single time for the map to recreate itself, which can be quite, it can take some time, right? We've, we've talked about this. So the fact that it just updates means that the user can get new information in really a fraction of the time. So here's our map. Um, as expected, we have the population farming as a continuous variable with a color palette that is quite aesthetically pleasing. You can supply other color palettes however you want. We have a pop-up message, which we said we just want it to be the, the county name. Um, so uh yeah there's not really much customizability in terms of like how you want this output to look like for example you can see that this pop-up message has like the color blue as the background i don't think you can change it but it doesn't look bad <laughs> um and then you can click on other uh crops and you'll see that the map updates uh quite fast and so does the legend Okay, so that's D3. Um, as you can see, it, it took maybe like two or three minutes of explaining because it, it is really that simple, um, but obviously uh, cannot really customize it beyond that unless you do want to invest time in learning JavaScript and writing your own JavaScript code. So yeah, that's... That's all for me. I have um, all the references that I used uh, in terms of 
making this tutorial and getting the data for this tutorial. Uh, if you're going to start your journey, please uh, look at these leaflet for R and D3 maps with R. They contain many examples and a lot of code that can get you started, you know, kind of right away. Um, also, this book, a fantastic resource, um, really, really in depth. I mean, it has basically any application you could think of um, with explanations on 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 the processes and what the packages do and what the commands do so uh, really really great for you know if you're going to do a more advanced uses of uh, spatial manipulations thank you uh, th th thank you so much um, asma for that um, amazing um, session um, I've really learned a lot. I also I even had no idea SF stands for simple features, but <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So and I'm sure everyone else has learned um quite a lot. So for this session, we are going to have um a Q and A. So if anyone has a question, um kindly highlight it, either in the chat or unmute yourself. But mm -hmm. um, as we await more questions, there was a comment from um, what's her name, Martha Luca. She was seeking assistance on how to get around installing the SF package on the Apple M1 chip. Yeah, so I don't know, does anyone have an idea on that? How to get around installing it? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Martha. Um, are you part of the R for DS Slack community? No, if, I'm not. Oh, if you are, please join that Slack community. And I think we can better help you that way because we'll have to inspect like the output that you get when you try to install it and all that. So I'm happy to help over there. I'm, I'm on that Slack community and it's just my first name and my last name. So tag me and I'll, I'll take a look. Okay. Could you please share the link to the Slack? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, does anyone have any question? Um, so people are saying thank you for the great presentation. Yeah, my pleasure. And I'm, I'm sure people will have questions and, and things mm -hmm. that they are stuck on once they start mapping. So please um, yeah. feel free to reach out to me personally on Twitter or through that R4DS community. Um, also, the R4DS community has a Slack channel specifically for spatial stuff. So if ever you're stuck or wondering how to do something, there's so many people there that are willing to help. I've used it myself actually, when I was uh, working on my COVID-19 app when someone, someone really experienced came to my help. So feel free to, to take advantage of the amazing community um, and not you know, be stuck alone and frustrated. And <laughs> so we're all here for you. Uh, th th thank you so much. Um, Benson is also saying great background. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so, uh, sorry? Oh, I was saying great, thank you. Um, I, I had a lot of fun giving this talk and I'm looking forward to seeing all the maps that people create. Um, and if you have any questions, once again, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Oh yeah, so, um, there's a question, um, when do, uh... Uh, Yes, so basically once you have your shapefile data frame, you can join it to any other data frame. So you can, you can in, yeah, exactly. You can enrich it with any other additional CSV. I hope that answers your question, Cooks. Yeah. Oh yeah, he says, he or she says thank yeah. you. Yeah, that's the advantage. When you inspect the output of the um, CHB, you'll see that it's both class SF and also data frame. So the fact that it's a data frame means you can join it to any other CSV that you'd like and do any other things that you regularly can do with a, with a regular data frame. The only 
added advantage of that data frame being class SF is that you have that geometry column consistently all the time, no matter how many manipulations you do. Okay, any more questions? But the, the, the beauty is um, that Asma, you've shared your details, your Twitter, um, your Twitter handle. So in case um, anyone here has a question, um, feel free to reach out. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thank you so much everyone for joining. Um, once again, um, in case of any um, queries, if you want to reach out at uh, this our Twitter, this our so social media handles, um, kind, kindly note that we will share this recorded session on these same platforms and also upload it to YouTube. So um, in case you missed out on something or you'd like to share um, this, what you've learned during the session with um, other participants or with the community at large, um, we will definitely share the link to the session. So yeah, so that marks the end of the tutorial. And um, feel free to live at your own peril. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.